it's that time of year and your email boxes and inboxes are filling up with cards and emails requesting donations for end of year giving from a host of nonprofits. Perhaps you too are getting calls from nervous college students asking you for a donation to your alma mater. My college knows that I want that 2022 calendar so bad that I will make an online donation stat. If you've ever given a dollar to your local school bake scale, after school program, or college, then you are an education philanthropist. I'm a former educator, researcher, and policy advocate. But as of the last two years and nine months, I work in institutional philanthropy, meaning I make recommendations on where my institution should give grants to organizations doing important work in education. This is not a job I ever envisioned myself in, and most days I really love it. I get to work with awesome, smart people, I get to connect with folks from all across the Twin Cities area, and be a small part of their essential missions. But I'm still very much learning. It is a great job, but I had no idea about all the dynamics that can be at play in philanthropy. I mean, it is a total black box to those outside of the field. Like, what is philanthropy? And even for some of those who are in it. Now, a couple of years into my job, I've started to understand how nuanced and complicated it can really be. It's also really daunting to make recommendations about hundreds of thousands of grant dollars. I get regularly intense bouts of imposter syndrome on a regular basis. And working in this industry has really propelled me to interrogate the positives and not so positives that come with the whole deal. I really just believe it's important for people to understand more about the intersection of education and philanthropy without having to actually work in that intersection. Especially since philanthropy is a field that spends a lot of time and resources in education. So I'm talking to the teachers, students, parents, and community members who maybe haven't thought a ton about how private charitable giving might impact their educational experiences. I do wanna shout out nonprofit leaders and fundraising professionals who already know much of what I'm talking about since they interact with donors all the time. So in its most basic definition, and not to get too Webster's Dictionary says on you, Philanthropy refers to donations of time, money, or other goods for a charitable cause. In its most complicated definition, philanthropy describes the full-on institutions who have endowments or budgets, full-time staff, and unique application and grant-making processes. These are usually called foundations. So you might think of the McKnight Foundation, which is an international funder actually headquartered in Minneapolis, or the Ford Foundation. Or you might think of intermediary funders like the United Way or my organization, the Constellation Fund. In this talk, I'm going to often refer to institutional philanthropy. So that's the community, family, and corporate foundations with defined funding priorities who make grants at significant levels to all levels of education. But I am just speaking for myself, and definitely not on behalf of any institution, including my current employer. Education grant making is a huge part of many philanthropies' work. And on the flip side, many major education initiatives are driven by philanthropy. A 2021 study found that more than one quarter of charitable giving by very high wealth donor families goes to education causes from early childhood all the way to post-secondary education. Though, to be super clear, foundation and individual gifts are a fraction of the education-directed dollars in the public sector. We're talking on the scale of $71 billion from individuals and foundations versus $752 billion from, from public sources. In fact, this brings up a rather interesting point. Foundations and donors actually have a rather outsized influence on their respective areas of giving. And this is true in education. But even individuals with less wealth are often drawn to giving in education, whether, again, it's your alma mater or, or a local lo youth organization. Overall, the Giving USA report for 2021 
estimates that 15% of all charitable giving, both institutional and individual, goes to education, which is a share that is only second to religious causes. Again, my guess is that the vast majority of the folks watching have made some kind of donation to an educational institution or organization already. I think about my time as a middle school teacher on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. For the most part, I had enough resources to meet the material needs of my classroom, but I would have given my left leg for a set of class books. Probably inspired by my own middle school experience, I was extremely intent on reading Holes by Louis Sekar with my sixth graders. But rummaging around in various storage closets could only find random copies of, of Mice and Men. Generally speaking, there were no full class sets of any one novel to be had, which made it impossible for the whole class to read a book together. So I set up a donor's choose project and friends and family really came through. They donated enough for me to be able to buy a number of class sets for my classroom. This was educational giving on a micro friends and family scale. Now you might be thinking, well, that's great. That's so much charitable giving is education focused. We actually need more funding for our schools and youth programs. What could be the downside? I think when we start talking about larger scale philanthropy, the stakes can become different. On a bigger level, institutional philanthropy, and also given driven by very high net worth individuals, can lack accountability. Unlike most other sources of educational funding, for example, the federal government, state government, or local property taxes, institutional philanthropy is typically privately held dollars and is therefore not subject to the same levels of accountability as public held, publicly held dollars. So for example, if a policy is adopted by a school district, but it doesn't really work out, or even straight up fails, you are probably gonna hear about it in a school board meeting. Someone might even be yelling about it. You might see an op-ed about it in the paper, and that op-ed might lead to a review of the policy. It may even have repercussions for a future school board election, and you'll have different school board members. Now, all of the same reactions might be true for a failed initiative that is primarily supported and funded and driven by a foundation. But ultimately, institutional and individual philanthropies are much more insulated from political pressures and political accountability than a public elected official is. Some philanthropies will issue annual reports to share how different grants and initiatives have gone, but some don't even disclose their gifts publicly. Typically, these reports aren't going to be the basis of continued employment or existence for that philanthropy. Foundations might rely on academic research or community-informed need to drive their priorities, but this is not the same as an electorate telling its elected representatives what changes they want to see. Really, at best, political damage for the foundation is limited to public perception. And ultimately, if you're someone giving out money, most people aren't going to close the door in your face for too long. A high profile example of this can be found in the work of the Gates Foundation on incubating and implementing the Common Core Standards. The idea was not born at the Gates Foundation, but it was championed there. So starting in 2008, some $200 million were channeled into building nationwide political support for the newly re redesigned standards that sought to, well, standardize the learning expectations for each grade level across subject areas and across states. While the standards were quickly adopted by the vast majority of states and are still in place to this day, by the mid-2010s, people from both conservative and liberal camps came out hard against the Common Core. Personally, I believe the Common Core push was trying to solve a relevant issue in our educational system, that of widely varying educational standards across states. But a top-down approach to education policy that was perceived to be driven by an institution and a billionaire not beholden to public accountability led to plenty of opponents. And yet, at the end of the day, the funder in question continues to be one of the largest education donors in the world. 
that's a big picture example of how private charitable giving poses a challenge for education systems, schools, and nonprofits. On a smaller scale, philanthropy can also perpetuate disparities because of its reliance on social networks. So many, many people have told me over the course of my life that something like 80% of jobs are secured through networking or who you know. And yet I've somehow never managed to actually network my way into a job. I'm definitely doing it wrong. But the same can be true at, in philanthropy at pretty much all levels. If you're a small nonprofit or a school in an underserved community or even a lower profile district system, it may be harder to get on the radar of individual or institutional philanthropists. And especially if you're a teacher or school leader, you definitely don't have the time to devote to the kind of network building that very successful fundraising requires. And because of this dynamic, those who are already more well-connected have more success raising, more funds, and then the cycle kind of perpetuates. There are many individual philanthropists and foundations who are working hard to change how this works, but change can take time especially in the places where the status quo maintains wealth and power. But say you do get a grant from a foundation or a generous individual donor, yay, this is great. This might come with some expectations around reporting and maybe some restrictions on what the funds can be used for, but it gives your school organization or district some breathing room for basic operations. It may fill a budget gap and help to sustain essential services. But, and this is where the promise of philanthropy is most relevant. It can also offer resources and flexibility to try out new things. Just as a funder's insulation from political pressures means it has less accountability, it also means that it, me it has the ability to experiment more. We can fund new ideas and seed new programs with a little bit higher risk tolerance. So going back to the Common Core example, Bill Gates actually articulates this point rather well. In an interview cited in the Washington Post article, Gates says his role is to fund the research and development of new tools, such as the Common Core in that case, and offer them to decision makers who are trying to help improve education. It's up to the government to decide what tools to use, but someone has to invest in their creation, he said. In fact, Three of the largest education funders recently made a $200 million investment in an organization focused on inclusive R&D, citing how education as a sector spends far, far less on research and development than other areas like health or computer science. Another major positive is that funders can give much needed resources to underserved places in sometimes a much faster way than the public sector. Within my first few months as a grant maker, I got to listen to Edgar Villanueva, the author of Decolonizing Wealth. It's a book I read within weeks of starting my role. And he was in town to speak and shout out to the Minneapolis Foundation for that event, another foundation funding important work. I sat in that airy, light-filled hall and just felt like he had given every confused thought I had about my new role, words, and a path forward. Villanueva has many criticisms of philanthropy, but has also helped me to understand that money and charitable giving can be a form of medicine or one might say reparations. A fairly recent example that illustrates this uh, is Mackenzie Scott's 2020 gifts to 23 historically black colleges and universities. Her gift totaling $560 million came with no strings attached and were free to be used by receiving colleges as they wished. Without getting into the ethical considerations of where the wealth was generated, which is an extremely important question, but not one that my 20 minutes of airtime will allow for, this strikes me as a way to inject lots of resources in a relatively targeted way in places that have been under-resourced for many decades, and it was done quickly. Would I rather have every HBCU be funded so they had the same endowment as Duke? Yes. But seeing that schools like Duke University had a pretty huge leg up, a gift like Scott's can show the possibility of starting to level the playing field. At its best, I believe philanthropy can be a lifeline to a new idea or a new organization. 
especially those that are trying to prove effectiveness early on, but are perhaps riskier for the public sector to take on. I don't believe philanthropy will ever be the answer for the most fundamental questions and disparities that are baked into the American educational system, but it has its role. Just go into it with your eyes open. So here are my conclusions. First, you are likely already an educational philanthropist. Think about your giving with care and intention. I challenge you to think about where your personal values and inclinations lie. How do you think about equity when making your donations? How might you hold yourself accountable to your giving while still ensuring that your cause, organization, or school has the autonomy to achieve their mission in their own way? If you work in philanthropy, I'm adding my voice to the collective call for action to de reduce power dynamics and create more transparency and accountability in the field. This likely means that you'll have to be more vulnerable and act to be an agent of change in your institution to push away from paternalism and towards partnership. But if you love your work as much as I do, I think you'll believe it to be the right thing to do. Thank you.